everyone, welcome. Thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. We're super excited to have this awesome panel here to celebrate our excellence in casting at Me 2019 panel. Few things before we get started. Last call for parking validations. Is there anyone who has not gotten their parking ticket validated? Awesome, if you will go, they will help you right over here. They will find the velometer and get your ticket validated. Also, last call for question cards. Is there anyone who has a last minute question for one of our panelists and needs to hand in their question card? Okay, great. You have like till the time I finish speaking to pass it to one of our volunteers over here. Just a reminder, we are videotaping this and archiving it in our YouTube video gallery. You can find it after this panel at um, youtube.com slash SAG After Foundations. You can watch it as many times as you would like. Because we are filming it, we ask that you do not video record or take any photos on your cell phone. We want everyone to be in the minute and enjoy the panel as much as they can while they're here and can watch it again later. Lastly, out of respect to the time that our panelists are donating to us tonight, please, please be respectful of the fact that when we finish, let them exit before everyone gets up to leave as well. So thank you, enjoy the panel, and um, I'll go bring out the panelists. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, um, good evening, good evening. I'm Russell Boast. I'm an independent casting director and the president of the Casting Society of America. And I'm super excited to be here today um, with all of you. Uh, moderating with David Rubin on a panel, I actually had to Google what to wear when you moderate a panel with David Rubin on it. <laughs> and um, and nothing, nothing showed up yet. Yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, super nice to be here. I want to know if this is making you guys nervous because, because I know when actors bring these iPads into my office, I'm like, it's going to go down and it's going to go down the wrong way. And, and now here, here I am with the... Uh, how you, everyone okay with it? Everyone okay? Yeah, good. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so let me introduce our, our, uh, our guest this evening. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, David in the middle. Uh, he began his professional career as a production assistant on Saturday Night Live and then joined forces with New York uh, casting director Mary Goldberg on films like Ragtime, Silkwood, and Amadeus, one of my favorites, before moving to Los Angeles to work with the legendary casting director Lynn Stormaster and ultimately opening his own office. Um, his credits include The English Patient, Men in Black, The Talented Mr. Ripley, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Lars and the Real Girl, Hairspray, and he has received Emmy Awards for HBO's Game Change and Big Little Lies. He was also recently elected the president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. More importantly than that, he had a recurring role on the soap One Life to Live. True story. Yeah. That's a story I'll tell later on. <laughs> after we all have a couple of drinks. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to move over to Dorian Frankel. Uh, Dorian has worked most recently in television comedy with credits including Veep, Basket, Single Parents, Future Man, Marion Parks and Recreation, Kirby Enthusiasm. Her love of comedy was nurtured during many, many years as an improviser. Uh, she also likes to poke around estate sales, watch House Hunters International, even though she knows it's absolutely fake. What? Uh, uh, and the one thing that I think, or she thinks a lot of people don't know is that she's also a folk indie pop singer with an album available online. And I listened to some of it today and A Handful of Sunshine is my new favorite song. Oh. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you, that's very kind. Um, I want to redo my intro. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then Rachel Tenner, last but not least, uh, upon moving to LA, Rachel worked for Ellen Chenoweth on numerous Coen Brothers features, who, and received the Robert Altman Award for her work on A Serious Man. More recently, Rachel has worked on series such as Fargo and George Clooney's Catch-22, and is currently working with George Clooney's new, uh, on his new feature, Ether, is that correct? Is that how I'm yeah. saying it? Um, as well as Ben Stiller's new series, Severance. She has also appeared on The Price is Right. Who knew? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys. So, 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 so congratulations um, uh, on your nominations. I would like to kick off this evening by asking you uh, where you were when you found out, how you found out that you were nominated this year, okay? And, and then immediately what followed finding out who you spoke to and what the next conversation was. Ah, uh, it was one of those, I woke up, I forgot it was the day I looked at my email and some manager had said congratulations and I was like, oh, that was today. Um, which it doesn't, that, that, that sounds super like humble braggy and it, I just honestly, I just hadn't, I so. It, humble it, braggy is why we're yeah. here tonight. <laughs> um, I now I have to look up who that was. Uh, so I said thank you and then I told the person I live with and we're like yay that's cool um, and then I went to work and uh, got a lot more emails and thanked a lot more people and congratulated some people and uh, it's a nice day beautiful David uh, well it happens early in the morning so I'm sure that I was in a bathrobe someplace and I <laughs> um, someplace. <laughs> <laughs> you know I just I never know where I'm gonna end up I just I don't um, and, uh, and I did hear from Jean-Marc Vallée, the, the director of Sharp Objects, uh, pr you know, er early, you know, early on, because uh, he lives in Montreal, so um, it was an easy call for him to make, and I happened to be awake in a bathroom. <laughs> oh, this is really capitalizing on what I feel is my early dementia, because I have no memory of what the happened that day. I feel like it's probably like Dorian. <laughs> like, I feel like somebody emailed me congratulations or texted me, and then I was like, oh, great. Ah, yeah, and yeah. then told people and people emailed and so on and so forth. I can't exactly remember it, but I will probably midway through this thing. Okay, so that's I'll great. Come, I'll come back. Whenever I'll definitely you come do, back just to raise your hand yeah, exactly. and then we'll go back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, when you guys read that first episode or the pilot or whatever it was, um, did you, what struck you about that, that script for, for, the, for the show you've been nominated for? Well, I took over the show after a number of seasons, so um, I was fortunate to just sort of be familiar with it and a huge fan. And just the, the it sort of came about because I had worked for um, one of the executive producers on one show and another of the executive producers on another show. And I literally, out of the blue, got a call saying, because uh, Allison Jones had done the pilot and I think the first four or five, se five seasons, and she wasn't available to do it. and so I didn't have to read anything because I knew the show and it was literally, you know, usually you have to meet on things and you have to make an impression and make lists and tr you know, try to get a job. This literally just sort of appeared and I was just like, wait, wait, I'm get, I, I'm get, we're gonna do Veep? Uh, they said, they're like, do you wanna do it? You have to meet with Julia, but um, I don't know that they met. It was just a lucky, it was just a lucky thing. It was a lucky thing, but based on, you know, experience in history so w were you a big fan of the show oh my god yeah yes <laughs> and throughout yeah it doesn't get better than that I mean it I'm not saying the show doesn't get better the show is always great <laughs> it doesn't get better than that show um, David tell us about Sharp Objects Sharp Objects was my third collaboration with Jean-Marc Vallée I, I had met him on a film at, at uh, Fox Searchlight called Wild that we with this one started uh, about a woman who uh, takes a very long hike and finds herself <laughs> um, um, and um, uh, and then Big Little Lies. Uh, so uh, I knew that this was pending. Marty Noxon was the showrunner and and sort of main main writer on it. Um, so I, I think I'd first uh, read the book. Jean, Jean Marc told me to read the book. Fantastic read. And then um, I had a meeting with with Marty Noxon, um, and uh, we had a understanding of where it needed to go what what I was m so it was the book first and what impressed me about it and what generally I feel about sharp, object, sharp objects is that it's it's a mood piece it's a character study of a Amy Adams character Camille Preaker 
Um, uh, it's not, and it's a bit of a detective story, a bit of a whodunit, but not really. It's not strong on narrative. It doesn't have cliffhangers at the end of every uh, episode. Uh, it's a, it's it's a kind of a show that, in some ways, it was better suited to, I think, to binging than to episodic watching because it's not as though you were sort of waiting to see a new narrative development at the beginning of the next episode. Um, it's, I think, the kind of show that washes over you. It, it's a, it's about a, you know, a dysfunctional family, a deeply fucked up woman, and a town equally fucked up, and um, uh, and it was about and it intrigued me to create that mood, uh, different from anything that I'd ever done. That, that binge watching, I, I was listening to NPR as I do, and um, there was a conversation about the uh, cable platforms moving back to uh, the network kind of s uh, way of rolling out series. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, they're, they're going to, I think the next move, because the distribution landscape is shifting, you know, on a weekly basis, but, but uh, I think what they're going to do now is they're going to release three or four episodes to get you hooked binge-wise, and then they're going to slowly roll out week after week so that you're you have to wait for the next thing so they're they're, they're going to try to use the best of both worlds like a hybrid of the two a hybrid of the two which you know i do i do understand but once you're hooked you want it all oh, yeah. Yeah. you really do yeah that's that's how they get you and that goes for so many things <laughs> <laughs> um rachel uh, tell us uh, about escape at danamora um yeah. when you read it the first time so I, um, I had worked with Ben Stiller for many years now, and he had already kind of put it out there that there was the show coming, and they sent the script. But I remember the whole, I don't know if you guys know the story about, um, about Tilly, and she slept with two of the inmates in the, in the correctional, Clinton Correctional Upstate New York, and she helped them escape and then lied about it and tried to cover it up and ended up having like a panic attack and going to the hospital and then the guys got caught. It's, I don't know if you remember this story. There's a huge manhunt for like 30 days. It was insane. And so when he sent it, when I got the scripts, it was, it was just a great, I already knew what the story was gonna be really interesting and I thought they did such an amazing job about not sensationalizing the whole thing, like really finding the heart of the characters and you know, presenting like the great challenge of trying to find people to play them, but bring all that humanity to them like you have to when you're trying to cast real people. And so the whole thing became very obsessive and he's very like immersive. So, you know, we flew, like we went to New York and then we all flew to Plattsburgh and, you know, they went scouting in the woods and I went to the Walmarts and I went to like, all, I went to the prison and sat outside at the donut shop and just to kind of get that feel of what the, area was like because it's a really specific part of the United States you know and I've done Fargo and I've done Coen Brothers stuff and you know and and there are a lot of worlds I think I've been a part of that are always like a little bit more you know left of center but this was because it was reality based it was just so great to like get to go and really feel we went to all the places they'd gone to everything in that show as a sidebar is like full on the manhole they come out of is the real manhole you know, the prisons, the real prison, like the North Yard, you know, the places where all the scenes take place are the real places that events happen. So they really went above and beyond to really try to bring some authenticity and, you know, quell the idea that it was going to be like a Ben Stiller romp, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Tell us, Rachel, tell, tell us about um, the, the process of, of the regulars and uh, ca casting the regulars in that piece. Um, the regular series regulars. Oh, yeah. Thing. So, I mean, I'm sure you guys would say the same thing. You want to, you obviously are casting to, you know, you're, you're really looking for the essence of somebody more than an exact physical match because, as you know, like there's a lot of makeup and hair and there's a lot of transformation that can happen on a show. So a lot of it was about, you know, just trying to find who really embodied it. For like Richard Matt, like who had that alpha quality that one minute could be so charming and seductive and the next on this drop of a hat would stab you. You know, and that's Benicio. <laughs> In the nicest way, that's Benicio. But like, and you know, and then, <laughs> and you know, Paul Dano, it was exciting because I felt like um, it was fun to see him be also be very alpha in this, you know, and really uh, show a side of him that, not that he hasn't shown before, but that we got to just see a lot more of. And Patricia's obviously Patricia, who's like the most fearless actress. She's so, has no, <laughs> you know, um, she's, 
I can't think of the word I want to use. She's brave. She's yeah. brave. Yeah, yeah, she's really brave. You know, she never worries about what everyone's going to think of her. And, you know, she's willing to do anything you want as long as she thinks it's obviously it's right for the story. And then, um, and then Eric Lang was Lyle Mitchell. And so Lyle Mitchell is a really specific guy. And for that one, I actually sent out the YouTube interview with Matt Lauer so that people can see because the way he speaks is so specific that you think someone's doing a bit, but it's not. It's like very real. So it gave people a sense of what this guy was like, I think more so. And Eric just, you know, he really did the transformation. Yeah. Um, David, what about putting the cast together for Shop Objects? Well, we began with a great element, Amy Adams, who was a producer uh, on, on the project. The, the collaboration between Amy and Jean-Marc Ballet started because they were working on a biopic um, of Janis Joplin, actually, um, that, that uh, actually did not come to, to fruition, but they bonded over, over the sort of early, early days of that. Um, so, you know, we had a, a great start. The key uh, uh, casting challenge and casting element of the show was the, the character of um, Amy Adams, Camille Preaker's uh, young sort of stepsister, um, who was kind of, uh, not schizophrenic, but had but led two lives. She was a very obedient um, daughter to uh, a very complex and ultimately an evil mother played by Patricia Clarkson, um, but she was playing a role for her mother who, uh, who exhibited traits of this fascinating illness called uh, Munchausen by proxy syndrome, which is also featured in another wonderful television film this year. Um, uh, uh, but outwardly, she was the exact opposite. Um, she was a real teenager. She was pushing boundaries. She was highly sexualized, um, uh, drinking and, and drugging around this small town in, in Missouri. So we needed somebody with that kind of range um, and the ability to completely convince us both sides of that. And we did a, as thorough a search as I've ever done across the country in England and in Australia, um, you know, the, the world of casting has gotten very, very small thanks to technology, and we're able to, you know, put out a casting notice to uh, really around the world, and everybody's got a camera on their iPhone, and, um, and they can upload auditions, to, you all know this, to, to websites, and, and we can cover a tremendous amount of ground. Uh, and ultimately, it was a it was a self tape from Australia by a wonderful actress, Eliza Scanlon, uh, who had just started to do uh, television work in Australia. But she knocked us out, and there were a couple of other candidates, and we flew them all in to work opposite Amy, who was very interested and intent on playing opposite them in the process. So, uh, and the other the other collection of actors. Um, I was sort of pleased that there were a number of wonderful veteran actors who don't always get a chance to shine, and people like Matt Craven and Elizabeth Perkins, and who've been doing you know such splendid work for so many years, and and there was every once in a while you find a role where you feel like they can give full flower to the talent that they've always had, but they sometimes get marginalized in the supporting roles, and and uh, I was happy that uh, that that and Henry Cherney and a number of you know wonderful. Actors who um, uh, who were given, uh, you know, r characters of real depth and complexity to play. So it was a great pleasure to populate. Nice. Um, Dorian, coming into Veep, um, obviously the characters they'd been, you know, the, the great ones had been established, and they were all there, right? Exactly. Was that a challenge in terms of then bringing in your your smaller roles or your guest stars or whatever? What, what, what was what, what was that like? That is exactly you? the challenge because it's. Everyone works at such a high level on that show, and we need people that are able to, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these people uh, for even the smallest role. So we read a lot of people, you know, not a... There are actors who are very uh, skilled and established. They don't necessarily want to do these smaller roles, so we really just had to make sure that anyone we sent as a choice was, um, you know, up to uh, the level of... of acting and, and comedic ability that that they expected. Was there anyone that really like showed up for you that, that you put in, and, and I'm going to come back to all of you on this, if there was anyone in the supporting roles or the smaller roles that you really were like taken by? Um, you know, I want to reference somebody who, I, I suppose it was not necessarily a supporting role, but we, we had been given a few roles that we knew would be sort of important this season. Um, there was um, 
Kemi, it was originally Priya, uh, who was the candidate that was doing well for a while. So we knew we were going to have to find that person. We knew we were going to have to find Jonah's wife, Beth, um, <laughs> and uh, there are a couple of others. Um, so I think, you know, we ended up finding, you know, we see, we tend to see, there are a lot of known people in comedy, and you tend to see them in all these movies and shows, and they're wonderful, and they certainly deserve to work, and they're delightful, but sometimes it feels like it's the same people over and over again, maybe, to me. I don't know. So I'm always sort of intrigued by who else, who else there might be. Um, so we read a lot of people for that, and we had some, you know, we had a chemistry read with uh, Tim Simons, and that was, for the most part, fairly well-known people, and then one people who, one person who we had been familiar with and read a few times and just just auditioned really well and came in and was so clearly the right choice over more established people and that was Emily Pendergast and um, yeah. and you know the the season was foreshortened it ended up being seven episodes they shot a lot they wrote a lot so a lot of things that were shot got cut but she ended up in every episode so um, nice it was really nice to see. You know, she didn't skip a beat. She was just right in there with everybody. She was exactly who that character needed to be. Yeah. Um, David, was there anyone in the show for you? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, there, there's this, this character who was the suspect for much of the, uh, for much of the limited series, um, who played a bit of a loner, a teenage boy, um, who had a, an odd relationship with his, uh, a close relationship, but somehow suspect with his sister, who ends up being one of the murder victims. Uh, in this town, um, and uh, there were a number of high-profile young actors who were interested in the role. We decided that it would be great to have uh, a fresh face in it, so we saw all the sort of the kids who were about to break or really had had a kind of emotional chops. A, a boy with tremendous sort of inner sadness. He had he his parents had split up. He had moved from Pennsylvania to this very small town that he had no connection to, and um, uh, it came down to. Uh, two young actors. One was Timothy Chalamet before he had done any of those films that we now know him from, and the other was Taylor John Smith, and both really fantastic, but Taylor had a kind of a pathos to him, even just in silence. Sometimes you can just, very often I'll, I'll watch auditions without the sound. I find it extremely instructive. Uh, you can t tell when actors are listening. You can also see a lot of the, the sort of emotional play on their face where the lines no longer matter. Um, and when we watched Taylor John Smith, uh, uh, both with and without sound, um, uh, he had, a, he had a, um, a, a sort of a sympathetic quality and a, and a deeply wounded one, uh, which Timothy Chalamet can absolutely play, and we've seen him do it. But, um, but this one was seemed so innate that it was clear to us that it was, that it was Taylor. Um, you know, I mean, I'm going to say two actors who are actor, like big actors, but it was great to have um, Bonnie Hunt and David Morris in the cast. And Bonnie was someone that I had been talking about with Ben to play this um, woman named Catherine Leahy Scott. And we were talking about her, talking about her, talking about her. And then I was at Game 7 of the World Series for the Chicago Cubs that year they were there. And the next day, I was at the car rental place, and there were two people at the car rental place, me and the person in front of me who was Bonnie Hunt. And I was like, what? I was like, okay. Like, you know what I mean? I, like, I was like, it's so divine. I called Ben right there. I was like, she's right. Like, we talked. I was like, she's perfect, you know. And, um, but, I mean, we were already talking about her. But it was just really funny. And then, of course, David Morris, who um, – I, you know, we've had to put these reels together for the Emmys, so I had to rewatch the show like a couple times, and I just was so amazed by how brilliant he is, and kind of in every moment, he's just so amazing. So um, they were great. Ben also had this thing, you know, he really wanted to have this kind of dog day afternoon kind of vibe to the whole thing, and we sh were in New York, and so there were a lot. So he was very specific about trying to have people who have not done things before or not known for things already. So it was like we had a kajillion sessions, and that's a real number, because it was so many. <laughs> and we had to find, and to, you know, to be able to like find, and then like if we love somebody and I look at their resume, I'd be like, oh shit, like I'd have to say like, oh, full disclosure, he did, you know, he was, 
He did he a year. Escape from prison. Yeah, like he already escaped from prison. He did a year on blah blah blah, and then we'd be like, oh. But um, so we've got to find that for me, um, who because I'm based in LA, I really got to immerse myself a lot more in the New York scene and find a lot of new actors that I'd never met before, and um, so that was a lot of fun. David, you touched on this as well, and it's a similar thing where I, I read an article where you were talking about casting kids and and how it's it's you like to find kids that are raw and haven't been molded or haven't been modeled, and similar to maybe your experience in New York. Um, is that, uh, like, can you talk, speak to that in terms of the, raw, the rawness that you find or the, the, the excitement that you get out of an actor that maybe hasn't been trained into a corner or coached into a corner, or, you know, especially with young kids or teenagers? Yeah, I didn't have any kids, no. so yeah. I had a lot of kids, <laughs> um, and I've just finished a project with a million kids. Uh, uh, well, y as you one imagines, the, the Children are natural actors. They, they automatically, you know, you be a cowboy, I'll be an Indian, go. No filter. Up until a certain age. You know, as soon as you start to approach adolescence, the, the, the walls come up, the filters come up, because their own identities are very much in question. But when you're a small child, you know, you're who you are and you just go for it. Um, so there's that kind of abandon. And, and when, an act, when a young actor has now worked on scripted material over and over again, and, in, and not every circumstance for a young actor is ideal so that they're pushed for results as opposed to something organic, uh, and it's less about play than it is about delivering something that they're told they have to deliver, it changes the technique of an actor. It, 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 so, so, you know, if a young actor has been doing this for a while, um, it seems somehow performed as opposed to lived and natural. So, you know, ideally you want to find kids who have never done it before or who have done it so little that those ingrained habits, bad habits, are, are not evident. Um, so that it's, it's, re it's fun. And if you, give them an op if you give them an environment in which they feel like it is play, I mean, there's a reason why I think they call it a play when you're doing this. So, I, um, uh, so if you can capture that, you know, better, better that than a grizzled old veteran at nine years old. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot of life lessons right there. Um, all right, so we, uh, as casting directors, we all kind of got into the profession by default. We, we, there's, no self, there's no real training for us getting into the business. What was your, uh, Dorian, your, your oh, moment, I'm going to be a casting director? Like, what got you to that point, and then you realized, oh, this is, this is what I'm doing? Uh, I mean, I had been an actor in my youth and improviser, and... Uh, I eventually thought, well, maybe I should do something a little more stable. I'd thought about casting over the years because I'd, I'd met casting directors, obviously professionally, but also I was like in a card game and there were a bunch of casting directors. And it always, they always reminded me of me in a way, and I just thought it sort of made sense. But people always said, oh, no, you would hate that. You know, other people would be getting roles that you would want. And I just sort of was doing other things. And when I actually sat down to think about whether that was true, I realized I didn't think that was going to be an, a problem. Um, I had started working in real estate for a little while and I realized it's a sales job and much as I love houses, I don't like sales. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to see, I'm going to check out this casting thing. And there was a, a retired casting director in the real estate office and she, she's like, we're going to get you an internship. So I was, I was, you know, this was like a second career for me. So I was, I was a grown up um, and I started out interning. I, got, I interned in a couple of offices for a couple of months because it was a quiet time. Uh, it was uh, Lieberman Patton and uh, with Kathy Sandridge Gelfond. And then I, you, it used to be you could send your resume to breakdown services and then when people were needing, looking for an assistant, they would get sent resumes. And I'd heard that Allison Jones might need somebody because uh, Phyllis was now on the office and so her off, you know, Alice, she used to work for Allison Jones as her associate for many years. Um, and I remember I actually called there and I said, I heard you might, you know, have an opening. And they were like, no. I was like, Meanwhile, a couple days later, she had looked for some, for some resumes and my resume came up and I went and met her. And that was my first actual job. And it was just a really, really, again, very lucky first job to have. And, you know, especially s for somebody who wanted to be in comedy. Um, and so I worked there for a couple years. And since then, I would say I've had a lot of, I'm one of those people that's had a million jobs and a few careers. Um, this is the first time everything just felt easy, like people would offer me opportunities and people would support me and people would say, I'll call this person for you and say that you're good. And that had never happened before. So it's like, <laughs> all right, I guess this makes sense. <laughs> David, how about you? 
Well, I, I was a production assistant on uh, SNL, uh, specifically on Weekend Update, uh, for the last two seasons of the original cast. So it was Bill Murray and Jane Curtin hosting the new show and, and Gilda Radner doing her various characters. A lot of my time was spent with Gilda and with Alan Zweibel, who wrote all of her stuff, Emily Latella and Rosanna, Rosanna, Dan, and all those characters that she did. Um, but it was, it looked as though the show was going to stop, actually. Lorne Michaels had said, we're going to go out on top. All of the actors were uh, becoming movie stars. I mean, they were flying out here every, we, every f fourth week was off. So they would fly out here and do a film and then fly back. And sometimes even during the week, they would arrive late, like on Thursday, to do the Saturday show. So he said, enough. So we all sort of looked for work. And I just, by happenstance, met a woman who was newly head of casting at NBC in New York, because we were all in 30 Rock. Uh, in that building, Rockefeller Center. Um, and she was looking for an assistant. Um, uh, and uh, she hired me on a temporary basis. And I sat down at my desk, and there was a player's guide, which is, you know, the <laughs> ante <laughs> antecedent of, of uh, IMDb for all of you kids out there. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and I'm leafing through it. And, and so here's where it all sort of came full circle and was r destiny for me. I grew up in New York. I've been a theater goer since I was this high. I, I've been uh, immersed in the theater and, and completely devoted to it. And somehow, and I don't know how I got this idea, but when I was about, started when I was about 14 um, and through my teenage years, when I would, ever, I would go to a Broadway show, I had these little note cards, probably an engraved note card that I got from my bar mitzvah. And uh, I, would, <laughs> I, would, I would write a note to the star of the show Dear so-and-so, I'm a student of the theater. I'm looking forward to seeing your performance tonight. If it's at all possible, if you could leave my name at the stage door, I would be so thrilled to meet you. Wow. I would knock on the stage door, the inevitable guy chomping on a cigar, <laughs> Uh, and I would say, could you please give this? And I would say 95 or greater percent of the time, my name was at the stage door and I would be ushered into Whoa. the star's dressing room. <laughs> and I would have audiences with all of the great actors of the day. Um, and I would sit in their dressing rooms and they would regale me with stories and, you know, uh, just, you know, Angela Lansbury and Ruth Gordon and Elizabeth Ashley. And, um, uh, and I have, just to reinforce my nerdiness, I... Um, <laughs> I have every playbill of every Broadway show I've ever seen. They are bound in those playbill volumes. They're in chronological order. And, uh, uh, and many of them have wonderful inscriptions from the stars of these shows who were so generous with their time and wrote lovely things about me. And um, uh, so when I s found myself sitting in this casting office at NBC, I thought, this is what all that was. I, didn't, I actually think it now. I'm sure I didn't know what I was doing there. but but. It all kind of added up, and now I've spent my entire career talking with wonderful actors and communicating with them, so there was some inkling of it very early on. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> my story is exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. So weird. <laughs> what a fun Except I had a bat mitzvah. Um, <laughs> I, well, this is going to, but I was at NYU and I always knew I was going to work in the industry and was trying to figure out what I was going to do. So I interned for a producer when I was there. And then afterwards, I went back to Chicago and was working at a talent agency and a fax came over back in the day and uh, there was an internship open at a casting agency in Chicago. And so I went over there and I got the job. The first thing they were doing was Hudsucker Proxy. So it was like, you could already feel that energy. They had just done Groundhog Day. Like, it was just like you kind of walked into something that was, I felt was very palpable. And I remember just that excitement, like that energy I used to feel at New York when I'd go to Rockefeller, you know, and I'd walk, or you feel now when you go onto a studio lot, if you do, um, I still get that same kind of rush. And so it just ended up that the woman I was working for was kind of ready to phase out. So. I was an intern, part-time, full-time, and then bought the company all in two years. Whoa. So yeah, so then, so I was like, <laughs> I know, but like, you can imagine a 25-year-old like 
owner like smoking at my desk and we used to like we'd all smoke we'd like sit with the actors like there was no business going on it was all like you know we'd like shut down for the crossword puzzle at lunch you know it was like so bad I don't even know how we made enough money to stay open but we did and then um I ended up doing we were doing you know in Chicago, you do film, television, and commercials. And then I think I just felt like I'd been ready to really leap to the features full time. And Ellen Chenoweth just happened to call the office. And I was like, Ellen, I'm thinking about going to LA. And she said, I'm just about to go do the boys, um, to do Jill and Ethan's movie, Intolerable Cruelty. Why don't you come out and be my associate and see what, you know, if you like it. So then I came out with, to work with Ellen on Intoler Intolerable. And then, you know, the, Joel and Ethan were just making movies so fast then. So it was like Intolerable and Lady Killers, and No Country and Burn After Reading. And, and like it just all was in such succession that I just went back right away, sold my part of my company and then moved out here. And that was it. Amazing. Yeah. Um, we always get asked what we love about casting. What do you guys dislike about casting? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I now have a partner, Sibby, and... Uh, Sometime partner, sometime associate, Marlies Skensenhauser, who's been with me for like 10 years, who is every bit as capable as the rest of us. And I, I really like working alone in a lot of ways, but they like doing different things than I like doing. Like, I love going through submissions and watching reels and reading with people, and I don't care about people's schedules and <laughs> <laughs> dressing rooms and honestly how much they're paid. So that's stuff that I can do and will do, but uh, it doesn't excite me particularly. Right, right. <laughs> and it, it, it takes up a lot of time and effort. Yeah. You know, it's not all creative, um, but it's, yeah. Like, Sibby will just talk to agents all day and be very happy. Um, I, I like talking to agents on occasion, but, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay, if we pay them for two episodes, if we only use them for one episode, can we still do it for Top of Show? It's like, I, okay, I, that doesn't excite me as much. <laughs> <laughs> David, how about you? <laughs> Tricky, I mean, I, I too prefer the side of my brain that deals with just what's an interesting way to play this role and not worry about all the business stuff, but it's, it's an interesting puzzle um, uh, and part of it. So I've managed to, uh, to hone those skills. Um, I think it's just the, the prevailing attitude for a lot of people in the, on the business side of things to lie first and think about what the truth might be after. Yeah. Ev everybody's, everybody's sort of covering an, another sort of agenda. Um, and, uh, and it's frustrating to, and exhausting to sort through it. It's, it's always been this way in Hollywood and everybody's got, a, got their own plan and, and uh, working you know, both sides against the middle and all of this sort of jockeying for position, um, the sort of Hollywood shuffle, Hollywood hooey stuff. And, and you, know, you learn to navigate it, you do, and you become very adept at it, but it's a waste of energy and time. And um, I try to circumvent it by being completely transparent and completely open, and everybody is so taken aback by it <laughs> that mm -hmm. you sort of get them off their game, and then you can <laughs> sort of get stuff done. But it's, but it's exhausting. So I think that's the thing I like the least. Oh. I think um, for me there's two things. I, I feel that there's a lot more gatekeepers in the mix now. Like there's a lot there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen on decisions that didn't feel I didn't I don't feel like there used to be as many people involved and sometimes it differs by who you're working with obviously um, but that's one thing but I for me it's avails like I can't I can't <laughs> they're, they're I can't stand it it's you have to get when you make a list you have to get you know actors avails and so what we have to do is we have to get everybody's avails then we figure out who we are interested in. Then we have to go back and do a second round of true vetting, is what I call it, when I actually have to like yeah. push extra hard to find out the true avails. And without a doubt, there's always, you know, you know, so they tell you someone's free on Monday and on Thursday they're, you know, signed up for a movie. And like, it's just, the, I don't think people realize that you've gone to a studio or you've gone to whomever and said, oh, let's get this person. This person's truly a veil. And then you're like, eh, I'm sorry. You know, so yep. for me, it's become, uh, for my office, it's a thing we talk about all the time. We're just, it's a lot of avails because there's a lot, you're always making lists and lists and avails. 
and yeah, it's yeah. it's completely unreliable. And most of the time, you know, it's it's an assistant on an agent's desk just looking in a database and sending you what's there. And those things are not always updated, and nobody. It's yeah, it's. There's also so much production that it's difficult to even tell when somebody's finishing a job and starting a job, and and agents have succeeded in getting their clients to end a job just in time for them to start another one, and and they're motivated to do that, so they're they're inclined to say available when when they they, they've never worked on a production to understand what it means to try to carve out a schedule for a particular actor to change a location to move the board and all of that. So I, you know, it's a, it, there's an unrealistic expectation that everything is possible when everything costs money and each change in a, in a shooting schedule affects other actors and, you know, so it's a much more complicated scenario. Mm -hmm. It's just easier for them to say available. And I, I too am concerned about how many cooks there are in the kitchen, and I and I blame I blame the internet. Whoever invented that? <laughs> Was it Al Gore? I don't remember. Uh -huh. But um, uh, but the, uh, the ability to upload and make available with a link um, everybody's audition suddenly every executive right. at every network and every studio feels entitled to watch it and weigh in and people who are ill-equipped to judge uh, performances by all of you fine actors it's it's uh, you know it's frustrating um, you know leave it to the professionals I say yeah oh did, no uh, we have to get approvals on on the show that I'm on now on breakdowns and it, it's well, it every single I'm about thing to segue. you do has to get approved by two studios in a network. Yeah. And it just makes everything take so long. Yeah. I'm kind of I'm going to segue into this next question from all of this anyway. There's this documentary, and if you haven't heard about it, it's called Casting By. Go and watch it tonight. Please go and watch it tonight, the minute you get home, you know. And Casting By tracks um, the legendary Marion Doherty and then Lynn, you know, who you worked with, David. And, and I wonder if, if technology, you know, I look, I watch that documentary and then I look at what technology has provided and what it's taken away from our, what we do, you know. Um, do you guys want to speak to that a little bit? Because I feel like there's a, we got into this business, many of us, because we love actors and we want to be in the room with actors and we want to be talking to actors and, and introducing actors to directors and then, and then, and then having a, part, a small part of a person's success through their life, Breakdown Express, you know? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, uh, I've been doing this for enough centuries that I, that I, that I do remember uh, a time where we were casting without video at all um, and uh, people had to pay attention. You, you, you were intently focused on what was happening in the room, and everybody made notes on the, on the casting sheet afterwards, um, and, and it, it, it required a kind of focus. Then when we started to use video, I don't remember when this was, but we used to have on our interview sheets uh, a, a list of those actors in the session who would agree to go on video and others who wouldn't agree to go on video. Because, and it was mostly, truthfully, the actresses because they were, s the, the idea of going on camera without good lighting and makeup and hair and all of that, they were very concerned about how they would come off. Because it was, it was believe it or not, a new technology. So on each interview sheet, it would say no video, video, no video, no, and we would turn the camera away when that actress came in and we would do it. Um, and, and then uh, I remember a situation where we were, I was <laughs> in a room with the director, and the minute you put a monitor in the room, I was in a room once with a, with a wonderful actress, and I'll, I'll, I'll out her, it's the great Ellen Green, great New York character actress, uh, and we were doing an audition, the director was, uh, was watching the monitor, and at one point she stops in the middle of the street, she goes, hello, there's a live <laughs> actress in the room. <laughs> I loved her for that. Um, <laughs> And that was a kind of uh, transition that happened, you know, with, with video. On the flip side of that, video is a tremendous asset because the casting process is so evolutionary. The thing that you think you're looking for at the beginning of the casting process, you learn a couple of weeks or a month or two later because every time an actor comes in and reads, you learn more about the piece, right. about the role, right. about what you're looking for. And with video, obviously you can go back to somebody you saw in week one who might have since left town, and you can replay that audition and you can revive their chances and, and that's the answer. Right. So, you know, pluses and minuses. And, the, and obviously the way the world has gotten small with video, we can, uh, we can approach anybody in any country. Yeah. I, I feel like 
the difference for me is there is an immediacy to everything now that didn't feel like it existed then. Like I remember sitting with Ellen and we get those bins of like headshots messengered over and you'd alphabetize them and then you'd open them and then you'd write on the back of each headshot like who was the role and then we'd like have like, it was such an older, I mean it was an old system but there was such a pleasure in that process that I do miss, like I miss that I don't know, it just felt slower to me. Now I feel like everything, your turnaround is super fast. The mm -hmm. expectation of how fast you're gonna turn around sessions and this and that is so quick. And you feel like you're defying them by saying, I need a minute. Like I need to just sit with this for a second and let me prep this and let me get my brain around it. You know, same with like doing a list. Like, you know, you don't just churn them out so in five seconds. So, um, so that's kind of the difference I've noticed. But I appreciate, again, but I do appreciate all the things that um, everything affords us now because you really do get to access more people than you ever have before, and that's amazing. So, yeah, I don't know how anybody had time for all that. How right. how, could, <laughs> how did that happen? I I mean, for the most part, I I like technology. I like that um, when an actor comes in, we can be relaxed and we can do it as many times as we want and we can sort of work together to get the best thing to show and nobody's being judged by the first thing they did and I, I think that's a great advantage. Um, and also, things sometimes look different when you watch them back than they do in the room. Even if you're really paying attention, there's just, it's just different and since what people are going to be seeing is, is on screen, it's really useful to see how it feels in that, in that context. Yeah, I find that, that one, one trade-off is that directors are less likely now to be in the room uh, because they know that they can get a link to, to video. So you miss what happens when a director is relating to an actor, just in terms of the working process, because they get to, yeah. but conversely, every audition becomes a workshop. If I'm in, in, in a room with, an, you know, video's cheap. You can, you can do as many takes as you want. So, you know, that's, that's actually the, the flip side of that. You know, that you can really perfect a scene and, and you know what, what people are looking for. The, other, the only other thing I'll mention technology-wise is with IMDb, I miss the old resumes that actually listed theater training and, and um, you know, where you went to school, where you trained, and the theater that you did because IMDb has no place for any of that. Yeah. Um, I used to read resumes from the bottom up. You know, yeah. you start with the training and you start with the theater and then you get to the occasional television or, or film and, and that doesn't exist anymore. I don't know where you find it. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I guess Maybe. breakdown. Yeah. I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's, a, I mean, not for... No. Moving then into the self-tape world, um, do you have any tips that you want to throw out at the audience today in terms of doing self-tapes? I mean, just the basics, <laughs> like make sure we can hear it, see it, you know, um, make sure you're not doing it all in profile. You'd be surprised how many things come in just, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. Like just think about what we're watching, what you want us to see. So um, I think that's, I mean, it's so basic, but, and then I think for us, I kind of, I feel open to people putting down multiple takes and so I can, you know, pick something that I think is like the best out of them uh, if they're inclined to do so. Not all the time, but mostly, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen so many wonderful self-tapes and so many misguided self-tapes and I'm trying to sort of just filter out what the difference is. I mean, I think sometimes people try to do too much. They try to make it too complicated. Um, I think just keeping it honest and simple um, and don't worry about all the bells and whistles. I think, you know, you, you can just see what you're thinking. That's what we're looking for. I'm very, f I'm very forgiving when it comes to the, the visual and the audio on, on self-tapes. Um, for me, it's all about your scene partner. I think if you're, acting, if you're acting opposite somebody who's not an actor, who's the secretary in your agency, you know, somebody gets handed a scene for the first time, it's just I've seen so many good actors, missions get scuttled by, you know, uh, we all know what acting is. It's reacting and it's a volley. And, um, and I think for me, you know, I just ask everybody, and I'm hoping that actors are generous with each other and work op opposite each other and help each other out with, with their self tape. But it's, it's the scene partner for me. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let's get into some of these uh, questions from you, from you guys here. Um, so this is for Rachel. What are some of the most uh, creative ways in which an actor has grabbed your attention before? 
Like that answer is that they've grabbed my attention, but it's not in the positive way. <laughs> like it's always <laughs> some, you know, thing that I'm like, oh my god, you know, like what do you do? Like you know, I've gone out, I've come in, like you know, someone's taken off their top or like things like I've had like weird things like that that I'll never forget. Um, but they seem to always connotate something negative. I, I can't think of something. You know, again, it's all about the simplicity. Like you know, I'm not really looking for anything super creative to. Um, you know, to push yourself through. I'm just looking to see you do the work and do it well, you know, so I can't really think of anything. Okay. Yeah. And um, this is for all of you. Um, what do you recommend a talented, passionate actor who doesn't have a top agent do to get uh, on your casting radar? Mm. Boop, boop. Uh, you know, I was at a, a panel ish thing a few years ago, and somebody had asked me a question like that, you know, how do we. How do we get around the whole system to make an impression on you and ha have you think of us? And I, I gave some sort of babbly, lame answer. Um, and in the car home, I was like, I, of course, knew what I should have said, which was that um, a lot of what I do, I think maybe a little bit different, although obviously you do this too. Um, I have a lot of small roles. I have a lot of, you know, scale co-stars. That's my day in, day out bread and butter um, on all the shows I work on. and. We need great people to do a line, and a lot of people at top agencies aren't going to do that. So I look at every submission. Don't worry about it. I mean, I look at every submission for all the roles. It, I don't care who your agent is. I may have a feeling about an agency or a manager, but I won't hold that against an actor I don't know. Um, the thing is, most of my attention is on the submissions. Um, not that I won't think of people I know and put them in, but. I would say 95% of the people I hire are hired because they were submitted, they were called in, they auditioned, they did well, they were put on that link of selects that I sent to producers, they were chosen, and they were hired. So trying to get around the system seems like a huge waste of time and energy because every the way we hire people is going through the system. Um, so s and, and if you look on breakdown when people are submitted, at the list of agencies and management companies that are submitting, there's like hundreds of them. So I know it's not easy, but there is someone who will represent you because there are people who are represented who aren't necessarily experienced. So someone will represent you. Um, it doesn't have to be the best agency in the world when you're starting. Yeah. Just do, yeah, the good, do good work when you get in the room. Anything to add, guys? No, okay. it pretty much covers it. Covers it. I'm, I'm going to steal that. I'm stealing all of that. Um, all right. Uh, do you guys uh, have any stories about auditions that really gave you the chills or surprised you? Um, really stood out for you. In a positive way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many examples when you're working on a job of finding that person for your role and getting that high you get, you know, and having that visceral reaction where you, you know, someone, I don't know if it's always that somebody came in and did something unexpected that you weren't expecting, or it's just sometimes it's just finding a new person that you haven't met before who came in and really, you know, was amazing. And that kind of happens, I won't say every day, but I'm, a, you know, a lot. I mean, that's, I guess, our job. So. <laughs> um. Yeah. All right, no, no great anecdote, I think, to tell. I mean, you know, things go wrong in an interesting right. way. I mean, there's that. There are people who come tell in Tell us with one of those. <laughs> well, with too many props and, you know, right. I mean, all that yeah. stuff. I mean, I, I will tell the story, and I think I will say who it's about, because it's an actor I respect tremendously, but it was Mickey Rourke, who, who uh, is such a great actor, and he came into audition for a film for um, Hurley Burley, an adaptation of a great David Ray play that we did with Sean Penn and Robin Wright and Kevin Spacey and a lot, lot of wonderful actors. Anyway, he came into audition and, and it was, it's a, about a group of Hollywood people who live in the Hollywood Hills and there's a lot of drugging and drinking and all of that and he came in with a lot of props, you know, a, a pack of cigarettes and a bag of white powder and a joint and an <laughs> ashtray and a cocktail <laughs> and a thing. And, I'm, and I was reading this, this scene um, very intensely with him and um, and it's a volatile scene, and he was banging on the table and all that. And in the middle of the scene, I start to see smoke waft up from the carpet, and <laughs> the j the fake joint that he had lit had flipped over out of the ashtray, and it set my 
carpet on fire. <laughs> but we stayed in the scene. <laughs> we finished that scene. He was great. He was great. I was a little worried about the carpet. Um, and, uh, and then later on, I got a call from his manager saying, you know, let me know how much the, it was an area rug. <laughs> let me know how much the area rug was. I said, are you kidding me? I have an area rug that Mickey Rock set on fire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Still in his office today. <laughs> It'll be in the Academy Museum on Fairfax and thing. I just remembered having, we had a session with, um, with Joel and Ethan, an actor, and I'm not going to say who it was, <laughs> but it's someone who was very established Broadway, theatrically, and he read all the stage direction. So he'd literally be like, I'm not going. Charlie walks to the door, <laughs> sits down. Yeah. And, like, and it was so, I mean, Joel and Ethan, sometimes their scripts are so long. It was so much description and action. I've gotten self-tapes like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. And oh, I'm like... Goodness. I just was like, this can't be real. I thought, you know, you think it's always like a gag, but it was real. It, it was real. Um, all right, so here's a question from the audience. When casting, is it a benefit for an actor to let us know that they're also producers with projects in production? I don't think it's generally relevant. No, and I've had situations where that, where an actor was in the room and they said, well, you know, I've got a couple of scripts and stuff and uh, I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> I thought, thank you. Um, how many um, auditions or reads does it really take for an actor to gain your confidence enough for you to fight for them? Uh, yeah, One. yeah. I'm, I'm going but, yeah. like this, but there's yeah. an, there's feeding an the crowd. Assumption in that question, though, that I think sometimes, uh, you know, you don't always get a role because somebody fought for you. Sometimes you get the role because you just audition well and people think you feel like that person. Um, it's rare that I have to fight for anybody. I mean, I think generally that's not a big part of how people get hired. It happens on occasion. Um, but, you know, again, as, mostly I work in television, and if I send off some options of people who have read, I'm not going to send them anybody that I think is a bad choice. Um, so I will only send people that I think can do a great job, and then, you know, it's part of it in a way is sort of trying to offer a smorgasbord of options so that the, the, the showrunner can sort of, you know, they have a vision that I'm trying to help bring to life, but I may not know exactly what's in their head, and I, you know, you provide a few great options, and um, you can discuss things if they're, but, but really it's not about like, you pick the wrong person, because I'm not going to send them a wrong person. Yeah. Yeah. You consistently show up and do the good work, and we consistently bring you in for different things. It's Sometimes people are distracted, you know, directors and producers, if they're in the room, are, you know, have a million other things on their minds. And uh, if they don't see it exactly in the room, you know, you want to encourage them to relook at it or rewatch it. Or I always encourage actors to walk very slowly down the hallway as they leave <laughs> the office because there are those times where, you know, they'll go, well, I don't know, I saw if he would just smile a bit more. Wait a minute, I think he can. <laughs> Hello. Absolutely. <laughs> you leave the room quickly and the building slowly. That's yes, the exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is sending postcards an effective way to update you and stay on your radars? It's just, you, it's, it's such a crapshoot that it would have to be a postcard that landed on the desk where you were literally thinking of a role that felt like the way your photo happens to look on your postcard. I mean, th cause that's what I would respond to. And that to me is uh, unlikely. So I think it's, you know, your postage money is better spent elsewhere. Do, do you, would you agree? I agree, and I sometimes I feel like you know people are putting so much time, effort, money into um, getting an audition, and sometimes when they get the audition, their work isn't at a level that's going to actually get them the job. And I just think all those resources are, you know, obviously a lot of people are doing all of it, but it, it's those resources are it's more important to put those resources to being the best actor you can be. Um, so don't jump ahead of the of the acting to the marketing, I guess. Because yeah. right. postcards, yeah, it, I, it, they're fine. 
<laughs> not necessary. They're definitely not necessary, but right, but they're fine. But today I got some big box of a thing with markers and this and that, and I was like, you don't need to do that. No. You know, that's just a lot of money and it's not necessary. So, yeah, just keep stay focused on the. Um, <laughs> leading into, and this is my one of my favorites, um, is the social media following of it all. Um, does someone with a bigger social media following have an advantage when it comes to a role? Not have you ever me. experienced that? Never. <laughs> <laughs> but I've I've heard that people have had that experience, and I I've never been no. Have you? No. No, I would say hell no. Yeah, not there's, for me um, either. Uh, there's a, I mean, social media fame is very often a function of a of a very specific, very charismatic personality. So you can't take that away from the fact that people enjoy watching them in whatever thirty second increments on a, on a, on a, um, a website. Um, it's a rare occasion that somebody emerges from that world because they haven't done the training. You know, they have, they can deliver who they are and s occasionally there'll be a role where that works, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, the, every once in a while there's a, there's a role that is so specific that, I've, you know, if I saw somebody on a cross down bus that felt like that person, I would, and if I knew that the filmmaker was capable of getting that performance, I would bring them in. But for the most part, it's, you know, very few people can translate into an acting career because they haven't done the homework. And one little, uh, especially again in episodic television, once your audition is sent off, for the most part, they're just watching the audition. Nobody's looking at your resume, nobody's looking at your followers. They're making the decision based just on that audition. Yeah. I bet there's some youth oriented shows, though, that sure. really cash in on, on connection to uh, how many hits you get on you know, Instagram and such. Um, I will say this about those sites. When I'm exploring actors and want to know more about them, I do sometimes search and, and get on, in, uh, on their in, in Instagram pages. And, and you, know, you have to be careful what you post. You, I mean, because people are, uh, people are looking you up on all of those sites to see other sides of you, other looks of you, how do you really look in real life, and, and all of that. So I, I think it's... Uh, um, you need to pay attention to the amount of stuff if you want to be an actor to you know to to limit your exposure on those sites in terms of in in very personal circumstances and all, all sorts of things just be mindful of it yeah um this is kind of nice because you guys each come from slightly different worlds uh, up here today um how do you guys feel about a a actors coming in and improvising some of the parts of the auditions you know, I think that's really job specific. I always want to have a take where you're doing what's on the page, and then I'm certainly happy to do a take where we can play around a little bit more. Um, but, you know, it depends on my filmmakers. Some are very specific about their writing and want to see what was on the page, and others are way more lax about it and think it's fun to watch. Um, some t I think that's like a very... I think you should always come in prepared to do what's on the page. You certainly can ask, you know, if we could do another one where you play around a little bit more. But I feel sometimes I have people come in who are, can, have decided that they absolutely have to improvise. And I think that gets a little indulgent. You know, that's, that's not, you're not asking, you know, listening to what I say that pr the filmmakers want. And, you know, and that's just, you know, serving yourself. And that sometimes doesn't work. That always doesn't work, actually. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah. Um, I uh, like a little improv at the end of a scene. Sometimes I will initiate uh, an improv at the end of the scene when you're already in the character and just to see what happens when I, you know, throw somebody a line and, and all of that. But mostly it's a, you know, y as an actor, you have to understand the rhythm of the lines, uh, the rhythm of the scene. And if you're, f you know, even inserting an extra word can throw off a really, if it's well-written material, you don't need to mess with it. You should ride it like a wave. And uh, and I feel like it sometimes will will uh, work against you if you if you insert uh, too much. Yeah. And I I have worked on shows that wanted a lot of improv, and I've uh, you know so it just sort of depends on the show. One thing I've noticed though is, you know, I think I get that when somebody comes in and wants to add a line or keep going at the end, it's out of an effort to show what they have to contribute. But it often, you know, it, it's often the writer's room that's watching the auditions, and it comes across to them as, I can write better than you. And that's not going to work in your favor. So I think if, you know, sometimes I continue the scene at the end, too. We just sort of play out the scene. 
Um, if you can improvise in a way that feels like you just thought of it, that helps. Mm -hmm. If it feels planned and written, that's never going to work in your favor. <laughs> um, what sets one actor apart from the other actors? What is like the it factor for each of you? Easy for me. Uh, what sets an actor apart from another is their authentic self. If you go into an audition and go into that waiting room and think, oh, actually that's how I saw the part, they're gonna get, they're gonna get that part. Or, uh, you know, the only thing that you can really deliver is yourself in the role. So if you deliver your, there are lots of ways to play these roles and we're waiting for the person who delivers an authentic version of themselves in that part and that suddenly answers a lot of questions for us. We hadn't thought of it this way, but we're getting something extremely authentic. If you're, if you're thinking of pandering, if you're thinking of deciding what we want to see and have focused your, your preparation and your performance on that, I think it's misguided. It may not be the answer, it may be not, not the role you'll, you'll, you'll land this time, but if we get a very clear sense of who you are from an authentic presentation of yourself, and the next time we'll want to see it again, you know, in a different circumstance. So I, I feel it's just your genuine self. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, yeah, is that really <laughs> is. Yeah, make a choice. <laughs> I always feel like sometimes people come in without having made their choices and having any specificity, and, and uh, that never works. What is the one show that you wish you had cast that you didn't? Yeah. Barry. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> My, I'm gonna say Handmaid's Tale, and I love that we both picked Cherry Top. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, like, we'll she better not watch out. this. But <laughs> <laughs> Killer. Um, but I, I love Handmaid's Tale so much that um, Warren Littlefield, who produces Fargo, um, and I'm friends with Sherry and uh, Sharon, and then when he loves the Patriots and I love the Bears. And so I'm always like, every season I'm like, okay, so whoever wins, then you fire the casting director for Handmaid's Tale and, I, <laughs> and hire me. <laughs> That's our annual season NFL season bet, which of course doesn't come to fruition. And Sherry and Sharon know that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. Oh, this is tough. I, I mean, I love, I love British shows so much, so I, and I'm always jealous of the of the deep bench of wonderful uh, actors there and also actors that I don't associate with a lot of other performances so it seems completely fresh and and then occasionally it seems just people I love to see when I get to see them so I'm going to say Fleabag se oh. season two oh, I want to because Fleabag, it, to yeah. me it's it's uh, un un unparalleled in television in the last you know at least a couple of months um, um, uh, but but longer than that I mean I, I think it's extraordinary on every level yeah what do you, this is our, our final question for each of you, um, what, do you uh, what do you hope the future of casting looks like in the next five, 10 years? <laughs> what do you think it's gonna look like? Well, what do you think our I, industry is I hope everybody like? gets to have electronic sign-ins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which I just found out about tonight, which is amazing. I just hope that there's more, uh, that, that there's increased uh, openness to inventive uh, possibilities so that people aren't as, you know, locked into particular types. I think the, I, I hope that there's, there's more immediate diversity as opposed to uh, a sense of an obligation to have a diverse mm -hmm. cast. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it should be just a natural thing that you're seeing people of all races and sexualities and genders for a variety of parts. I mean, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Um, uh, and I hope we don't all get... <laughs> it won't be five or ten years, but I hope we don't all get so digitized that we're suddenly putting Clark Gable and Carol Lombard on casting lists. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and, the, and, and the check, they're available. Um, <laughs> But, but you know, I just, you know, the living, breathing actor. Hello, there's an actor in the room. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I just hope that that stays that way. Yeah. And I hope that casting continues to get the recognition it's really gotten over the past, since <laughs> I've been doing it, you know, and obviously with people like David and, you know, certainly 
running the show, so to speak, right now, you know, there's really a lot of opportunities, and the BAFTAs have now established an award. So it's very exciting, and I hope it continues to get the recognition that I think it deserves. Everyone works really hard. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, guys. Congratulations. Um, thank you to the SAG Foundation. Thank you, guys. <laughs>